second speaker is Vladko Vidral. He's going to tell us about quantum entanglement, quantum entangling living systems. He's a professor of quantum information at Oxford and a governing body fellow at Wolfson College. He's published over 400 research papers in quantum physics and quantum computing and is a Clarivet highly cited researcher. He's given many plenary and public talks, including a specialized talk at, Sol at the Solway meeting, and you get the idea. He's a very, um, very esteemed person, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk. I think I'll turn you over to him now to take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, it's really uh, kind of you to invite me to speak to you. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me well and you can see my slides. Uh, this will be a very uh, simple and brief talk. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it to be with you today. I absolutely love Barcelona. I think it's uh, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Actually, so it's always a shame to, uh, to miss this opportunity. However, I hope that uh, what I say uh, will be uh, at least a little bit interesting uh, for your meeting. Um, my uh, uh, my uh, drive uh, in this direction uh, it comes really from uh, the fundamental understanding um, of uh, laws of nature, if you like. And I think what drives us um, in quantum physics is this question whether quantum physics is a universal theory. Does it really apply to everything? Uh, we've tested it up to a certain uh, degree of complexity, um, but these are still extremely, extremely simple systems compared to, of course, anything we deal with in chemistry and biology. So we always ask the question, is there a limit uh, beyond which um, really quantum mechanics fails to apply? It collapses in some sense. Uh, frequently, there are many reasons for this that are identified by various uh, researchers, but definitely uh, living systems have played um, that role for a long time, even from the very beginning. Uh, of quantum mechanics. Sometimes people even say uh, the role of observers um, and living systems qualified, of course, as observers is crucial and that somehow may interfere with quantum mechanics. Um, my, my views are the opposite of this. Um, I, um, I think quantum mechanics uh, may be replaced by something else, but I don't think it will be because uh, it fails in the biological domain. So that's kind of the the bias that I have that I carry uh, into this field. And in fact, I think if anything, quantum mechanics um, is very democratic um, about the role of observers in the sense that there isn't any difference really between the observers and the observed. Um, and, and somehow that's kind of, I'm explaining, I'm explaining my beliefs simply because they color the kind of questions that I'll be asking. Historically, I think Niels Bohr, it wouldn't surprise you maybe, all of, all of the pioneers of quantum mechanics have, have really worried about what happens when quantum mechanics is applied uh, to living systems, right from the beginning, in fact. Um, so this may not even be the first uh, quote uh, that you will find that's relevant, but these, these are lectures by Niels Bohr in 1933 called Light and Life, very appropriately because I'll be using light and quantum optics to probe that as well. And I'll, sh I'll tell you about some of the experiments that we've been doing. Uh, but Bohr, um, and most of you will know, was very fond. He introduced this idea of complementarity, um, which kind of said you can choose to probe one thing or you can choose to probe another thing. But in quantum mechanics, you're prohibited from simultaneously probing these things. But I think Bohr saw this complementarity far beyond quantum mechanics. He thought it was a more general uh, principle that should guide us. So you can see the quote here, uh, that he thinks that the chemical basis, the quantum basis that enters into chemistry, um, and the organizational hierarchy are complementary processes. Um, and he even says, just as momentum and location are of an electron. So somehow the what Bohr would have said, and again, I disagree with this um, in a way, um, what Bohr would have said is that you can either probe the quantum side 
of processes in the in the living matter in detail. Um, however, that will require you to do experiments mainly in vitro. But if you want to test really what a living system is like and, and what, what, what it's like fundamentally, of course, uh, when it's alive, you will not be able to really go into the details of chemistry. So he really thought that these two things are somehow complementary. They can be studied separately with different um, technologies, if you like, techniques. However, you will not be able to capture both at the same time. And as I said, I, I don't think this is quite uh, right and, and 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 the experiments that um, that we would like to do kind of go a little bit in this direction to show that there isn't really um, anything um, complementary about these aspects. They can exist all at the same time. They can probably even be probed at the same time. But who knows? Of course, it's a wide uh, and open um, subject. Um, uh, technically speaking, we are really using. Um, um, the theory was developed in quantum information. And the question that we really would like to, to answer, and I think there is a, there is a, a large amount of work in, uh, in, in this field, is whether you can really find um, even quantum entangled states. Remember Schrodinger was the person who said that entanglement is the characteristic trait. It's not just one of the traits of quantum mechanics, but it is the trait. And usually when we look at um, a system, the first question we ask coming from this direction is, does it really support entanglement? Then between how many subsystems? So here I'm, I'm allowing, I'm, I'm writing a state that we would call um, a separable or disentangled state. Um, and I think, again, at some level of complexity in biology, we would probably expect most states to be of this kind. We wouldn't really expect entanglement maybe beyond certain um, spatial distances and beyond certain uh, time scales. However, that's exactly the interesting question here. Could it be that some of these processes in biology are really fundamentally quantum? Could it be that they really support quantum um, coherence, interference, and even entanglement, as I said, which would be a definitive uh, feature for us? And, and we've developed also, I don't want to bore you with all of these things, I just want to give you a, a flavor of, um, of, of, of these um, ideas. We've developed all sorts of techniques, how to tell whether a many-body uh, system is really in a quantum entangled state. Uh, and, and sometimes these measurements that we uh, call witnesses of entanglement could actually be macroscopic entities. And maybe that came initially as a surprise, but I think if you think about it a little bit um, harder, then the things that you naturally measure in the solid state, uh, things like the, the heat capacity maybe, or magnetic susceptibility of your system, um, and they do rely, and they are, they are dependent, they are defined in a way that they depend on the correlations between the individual constituents. And if these correlations are entangled in a quantum mechanical way, um, that should somehow intuition would tell us, and intuition in this case is correct, that should somehow really inform us whether the underlying system really does uh, contain uh, genuine quantum entanglement. So we've developed techniques, and of course the question is, can we um, apply these techniques to living systems? Can, can you really uh, show that at some scale living systems are also um, quantum mechanical? Now, uh, one thing that's not, um, so I already said to you um, uh, um, a belief of mine that you may find surprising when you read the popular press, uh, because in the popular press, what you will emphasize frequently is the quantum mechanics says that the observers uh, influence reality, modify reality, and all sorts of things that probably make no sense uh, at all. Um, so uh, I have a completely different view of quantum mechanics. Like I said, there are no observers in the observed. All we have is really entanglements between different subsystems in this universe. And interestingly, interestingly from this perspective, now, classicality um, is also a consequence of quantum entanglement. So here I have this very simple um, bunch of 
subsystems, you can think of them as quantum bits, but you can also think of them as being more complicated. And this sequence of gates here on the left-hand side is just showing that they get more and more entangled. So you could think of the first gate as telling you that the first quantum state of the qubit is observed by the second qubit, if you like that language. But notice already, I'm just artificially labeling the second qubit as an observer in the first qubit. There is absolutely no reason to do that, no asymmetry in this picture at all. You can swap them and it's equally good. Um, and that's the beauty of quantum mechanics, actually, the ultimate message as far as I'm concerned. So then you have a second qubit, if you like, being observed by a third qubit, and so on. It's a sequence of quantum gates. And you can understand the interactions in physics and, of course, in chemistry and biology, therefore, in the same way. It's a sequence of quantum gates. The more of these gates you do, the more entanglement you create. But globally, um, what happens if you, if you look at the system locally? What happens if, if you create this entangled state, but you only look at the first two qubits? They will actually not be entangled at all. They will be in a classically correlated state. And that's the, the right-hand side picture. That's the kind of topological uh, metaphor, if you like, with knots of what it means to be entangled. It means that I have all of these, all of these links, all of these uh, bands, if you like, rubber bands, which are wrapped around each other in a way that I can't separate them. They can never be separated in this state. However, if I cut one of them out, if I get rid of one of the qubits, that would be the quantum analog, the rest of them fall apart. They are no longer entangled. They are actually classical for all practical purposes. So it's very interesting that it's because entanglement is everywhere and it's because most interactions in quantum mechanics are entangled that we find it difficult to find entanglement in subsystems. It sounds a little bit maybe paradoxical even, counterintuitive. We call it decoherence. But it's because open systems like biological systems and complex systems continuously interact, not just within themselves, which would be okay for us, but they also interact with everything that's around them, that we actually find it difficult to isolate them and probe their quantum properties. So our challenge is not, not to find um, entanglement because everything is classical, but to find entanglement because everything is quantum. That, that's kind of the, the funny twist on this. At least that's the best picture we have. I'm not saying this will be the picture in 10 or 20 years' time. Maybe we falsify quantum mechanics. I'm open to all of this. But as things stand, it's been a remarkably successful theory, and there is no reason to really suggest that it's not at this time. So with this in mind, this is I, I just wanted to give you a slight background to, to where I'm coming from, and, and then I can maybe discuss the following a uh, couple of experiments that we've been, we've been doing and what we are planning to do and so on. But the motivation really is to take quantum mechanics from the microscopic domain and really test it in larger and larger systems. And, and ask, is it going to fail? Is it at, ever, um, at any point going to stop being valid? Are there any other laws of physics that are valid? So we were very lucky uh, to, to be funded by, by James Martin um, in the early days of, um, of this research, um, uh, who basically uh, invested um, uh, close to two and a half, three million uh, pounds over five years' time, which really gave us, uh, with a focus exactly on this question, um, do, um, do quantum systems, uh, do, uh, do, does quantum physics feature in living systems, and can we learn anything from that? Because once we once we, if we find that there are really natural processes that take place in highly noisy environments, um, at high temperature even, at room temperature if you like, uh, if they're really genuinely quantum mechanical, then, then this would be a great news for our technologies. It would mean somehow that nature managed to evolve a robust, even if it's a small scale, it doesn't, of course, no one expects a universal quantum computer to have evolved this way. But I think even if it's a small scale quantum computation, very specialized, this would be great. 
So with this in mind, we really, um, out of all, all sorts of discussions of this kind, arose the experiments that Dave Coles, he was a postdoc of mine a while back, you can see that this was back in 2016, uh, he basically thought of putting um, a living bacteria into an optical microcavity. Uh, these are cavities that are extremely small, of course, the dimensions are on the order of the wavelength of light that you use to probe these things, so you really want to trap light between the two mirrors. Um, and then you want to see what happens again in the in the jargon of in the jargon of uh, of uh, quantum physics you want to strongly couple the uh, bacteria to the light inside the cavity. That's basically the, the key uh, idea here. And the idea is to try to have um, even one bacterium at a time under the focus uh, that's basically, if you like, strongly coupled uh, to light. Um, and, and I don't want to bore you again. The, the setup, of course, is much more complicated than the image. Um, I just show you, but but showed you, but it's no, it's no different to what you would probably see in a standard a spectroscopy quantum optics laboratory. You would see, of course, a lot of um, yeah, lasers that are somehow through various optical elements um, modulated, if you like, in order to produce the right uh, input, which then goes inside the cavity, interacts with the with the system in the cavity, which then tends to radiate, and it's that kind of uh, light that you collect ultimately and analyze with a spectrometer. So like any any experiment, of course, you have the preparation stage, you have the dynamical part of the of the experiment, and then you have the measurement stage. It's, it's just uh, as simple as that if you're a theoretician like myself. Uh, so here are the pictures that, uh, that Dave um, managed to uh, obtain. And I think the idea I want to communicate here is that Simultaneously, this bacterium, this is one of those photosynthetic bacteria. Here you can actually see the relevant energy levels uh, inside the bacterium. Um, it basically has this base plate where light is absorbed. Then it cascades down, losing energy. The wavelength gets larger and larger. It goes into this famous FMO complex that's been studied quite a lot and ultimately ends up in the reaction center. But as far as we are concerned, these are just four different, among many other, of course, four different relevant um, energy levels to which we can tune the light in the cavity in order to make them couple strongly to one another. So what we really want to observe is the strong coupling, which is always a signature of quantum entanglement, really, at some level, and I will mention that in a, in a second. And that the bacterium uh, that's, that's being tested is really alive and well, if you like. And how was that done? Th th there were many exciting discussions how to try to do that, but I think Dave went for something that probably would be considered a standard, um, is, is, is to uh, really see, to inject another molecule, a dye molecule, which you can see here fluorescing in, 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 in purple, uh, which basically the bacterium, uh, if alive, would simply keep outside of its own boundaries. However, once the bacterium is no longer alive, this molecule would then be allowed to penetrate inside, and you can simply see the signal of the dye molecule fluorescing from within the system, which would signal to us that the system is no longer alive. And somehow Dave was trying to do these things simultaneously to show that the dye molecule is outside, it's repelled from the bacterium, and at the same time to show that the signal that you get from this kind of apparatus is, um, is a signal that indicates a strongly coupled state between the light in the cavity that's trapped between the mirrors and the bacterium. Uh, here are the pictures. Uh, again, I will, I will tell you very briefly about this, this kind of theory. It's really well understood. Uh, you have energy levels inside the bacterium the dipoles uh, that are relevant for this interaction inside the bacteria, which would basically, um, if they were not coupled to light, as you change the length of the cavity, as you change the wavelength inside the cavity, the frequencies, the color of light inside the cavity, they would uh, suddenly uh, become identical 
if the two were not coupled, if this would lead to some kind of level crossing between the energies of light and the energies of the bacteria. However, what you see here, and that's a standard signature of being strongly coupled, uh, is that these levels avoid one another. And the degree, the amount, um, if you like, by which they avoid each other, they avoid crossing each other, is exactly proportional to how strongly uh, they are coupled to one another. And the reason why you have different frequencies of different, different wavelengths is, as I said, the experiment simply proceed, proceeds by changing the length of the cavity, tuning the cavity each time to a different uh, transition that you can see here as you are changing the wavelength of the cavity, and then showing that at each of these transitions, the system is very strongly, uh, the cavity light is very strongly coupled uh, to the bacteria, to the system under observation. So that's basically the evidence if, if you speak as a, as a quantum mechanics, as a quantum optician, and I will show you this in a second, this is the evidence that the two are entangled. The simplest model, again, I don't want to bore you with, with too much unnecessary uh, mathematics, but the simplest way of modeling this and it is very coarse, and it doesn't take into account most of the things, but it goes to the heart of the of what needs to be done to model the experiments, is that you can really think of the whole of bacteria, all of the dipoles that make up the bacterium, that participate in coupling to this light in the cavity, you can simply model them at a very, very crude level as a single harmonic oscillator. Um, light also, because you're coupling to one frequency um, at a time, you could simply model as, as another harmonic oscillator. The difference, of course, in quantum physics is that there are quantum harmonic oscillators and their degrees of freedom are quantum numbers, if you like. They're observables, they're matrices that don't commute with one another. And what this leads um, in the ground state, for instance, um, is to a highly entangled state. The entanglement being exactly between how excited the bacterium is and how many photons are in the cavity. Um, at the level of one photon, you can think of the photon being in the mode inside the cavity and then superposed, superposed with the state where this photon is actually absorbed by the bacterium and the bacterium is excited. And this is a typical example of what Schrodinger would have called an entangled state. So it's, it was very interesting to us that, in fact, this kind of entanglement um, is accessible through these kind of techniques. And at the same time, the bacterium was alive and well. And, and, and so, in a way, going back to what Bohr was saying, there clearly isn't any complementarity of this kind. Of course, as you go further and, and test more and more properties, it's by no means clear that these kind of things won't fail. But at least at this crudest, simplest level that, that is accessible to us, things are possible to do. Very brief note on the entanglement, since we are speaking about it. You can actually even quantify the amount of entanglement, because once you have two coupled harmonic oscillators, you have a, you have a, a setting that's very similar to what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. In 1935, they wrote a paper, which together with Schrodinger's paper is one of the key uh, founding papers um, uh, that, that explore quantum entanglement. And so you can even talk about here, lambda is the strength of the coupling between the cavity light and the bacterium, and omega is just the basic fundamental frequency at, at which you are exciting the bacteria. And you can even quantify the amount of entanglement as a function of this. You can plot it and so on. So all of these techniques that we've developed in, uh, in quantum physics, in quantum information, um, can now um, be applied to studying living systems. And of course, the question is, do they really all translate? Can we really do all the things that we do in ordinary um, atomic physics, and I think that's really what drives this kind of connection. Of course, there are many things um, 
you may want to do this uh, once you have this kind of technology. You may say, why don't I genetic? And these are some images from, from my colleague Tristan Faro, who is actually doing these experiments um, uh, at Oxford. And we have a joint grant now from the Moore Foundation to proceed in this direction. I will tell you about this in the next five five minutes before I finish, actually. But one idea is, for instance, to even genetically modify um, the system bacteria, let's say that you are probing. In this case, I think uh, it's E. coli. It's a different bacterium. Uh, but basically, if you genetically modify them, could you tune them in and out of resonance with light? So could you genetically modify, for instance, these um, photosynthetic systems so they, they become better at absorbing light or they, they become worse? You can tune them out of resonance so they're no longer able to do this. And you can see how this, this is just basically asking very similar questions to Schrodinger. Uh, because in quantum mechanics, uh, using bacteria instead of cats, of course, but in quantum, in quantum mechanics, you can always interfere and superpose different things that you do. So it would be very interesting to see what really happens as you tune these systems in and out of resonance. Um, uh, what kind of what kind of states, uh, quantum mechanically speaking, would you get? Of course, practically speaking, you may be able to improve these systems that you are studying um, and and this may well have some some interesting applications as well the second experiment i want to tell you about before i before i tell you about uh, the um, the topic uh, that relates to the title of the talk is another experiment that was influenced by these ideas and here we're really coupling quantum bits um, to, to living systems. This was done by my colleague, Rainer Dumke in, in Singapore, who actually has been developing superconducting quantum bits. This is one of the leading technologies uh, in quantum computation. I think most of the big companies uh, in all of these um, online platforms that you can access and register yourself to, to use are basically behind them are, are superconducting um, quantum bits. Uh, what he really uh, did is, is took a, a much more complex system than the bacteria, in this case a tardigrade, uh, and put the tardigrade on a, on a superconducting bit, uh, as you can see in this very simple image, and then measured, again, the changes in energy levels, the splittings that I was describing in the previous experiment. So he wanted to see how much the energy structure of the qubit is really affected by the presence of the magnetic of the dipoles of the electromagnetic um, basically effect from the from the tardigrade, uh, the tardigrade was there, and then of course he introduced another qubit, like in this picture A and B, and then tangled these two qubits with the tardigrade being present on one of them. So it's like a hybrid system uh, between a living system and a, and the quantum mechanical uh, non-living, if you like, qubit. Um, so, uh, so uh, tardigrade was chosen simply because superconducting qubits have to be um, have to be um, cooled to very low temperatures. We are talking about millikelvin temperatures, so thousand times lower, even more, ten thousand times lower than the room temperature, if you like. And any, you know, no, very few biological uh, species would be able to handle this. But remarkably enough. Tardigrades were actually, this is a record as far as I understand, even for a biologist to put tardigrade under these very low pressures and very low temperatures. It goes into this state of hibernation that's called the state of tan. Actually. It gets rid of all the water. It basically becomes inanimate uh, during the experiment. However, it survives the experiment amazingly enough. And if you add a little bit of water later, it really becomes animated. I will just show you some, uh, some movies. Uh, that you can hopefully see here for fun. Uh, you can see why it's called the tardigrade. It's very slow indeed, but here it's sitting uh, between the two islands of a superconducting uh, qubit uh, inside the capacitor, if you like, um, and it's moving around a little bit. Um, I can show you another image really just for fun, uh, pictures that were taken uh, while this experiment was done. So this is yet another example of something where you can use 
uh, technologies that we've been developing in uh, quantum information and quantum computing. And you can now start to play games by making hybrid technologies uh, and combining um, living qubits, if you like, uh, with, um, with artificial qubits. So I'm almost there concluding. I want to show you the, the, the vision uh, for the project that we are doing now, and this is funded by the Moore Foundation, uh, started about a year ago or so, um, is, um, is, is really to scale this up um, and to really go in the Schrodinger direction and ask, can we really entangle, can we quantum entangle two living systems? Even, even if we just choose only subsets convenient sub parts of these systems, just as in the experiment that I was describing, could we really have, for instance, two bacteria that are quantum entangled with some kind of quantum optical technology? I think the picture here is a very simple uh, proposal that we presented at the, at the Royal Society, I think, at the Faraday discussion a while back. But the idea is to have two of these cavities one sitting in each arm of an interferometer. So this is your standard kind of quantum optical, what we call a Max Zander interferometer. You have a single photon source. You have a beam splitter where the photon is basically split into going in both arms of the interferometer simultaneously, the usual superposition, in fact, even entanglement uh, in this case. And then it gets absorbed in one cavity, either by one bacterium, which becomes excited, or by the other bacterium, which becomes excited. So the state would be a typical entangled state where one bacterium is excited and the other one is not, plus, if you like, at the same time, vice versa. And this would then be probed. In the standard, there are many ways of trying to collect the signal. Um, it's, it's a beautiful question. It's very complicated uh, experimentally. Uh, there are many challenges there. But at least, uh, theoretically, it's relatively simple to understand what it is that ought to be measured here to confirm this kind of entanglement. And then, to conclude, really, um, uh, the question is, can we even scale this up more? Uh, so these are really some um, uh, fancy pictures of uh, naturally occurring cavities um, in a sense uh, of the skeletons of various natural systems that have this periodicity and order, mm -hmm. which very much resembles an array of optical cavities that we can, for instance, produce artificially. And people like Marcus Arndt, incidentally, in Vienna, um, who does uh, wave interference of uh, more and more complicated uh, molecules, has actually been using some of these skeletons to do diffraction. The question for us, for instance, is, is could we scale our experiment up by inserting a living system in each of these and then trying to manipulate them with light in a way to create a more and more complex entangled state? So, so it, it's really an open question. Like I said, we don't know how far quantum mechanics goes in that direction, but that's the gist of it. Um, and because I'm running out of time, I think I will just go straight to conclusions and I'll be happy to answer, of course, uh, any questions. What drives this direction? Um, which is not to say that I don't find other questions uh, fascinating. I do actually, and I will mention them here. But what drives me as a physicist is really the question of whether quantum mechanics is a universal. Does it apply to all objects? Does it apply to living systems? Um, of course, my feeling, and I think these experiments go in the direction of showing that probably there isn't any complementarity between, between being alive and being fully quantum mechanical. I, I'm guessing both could be probed uh, under suitable conditions that have to be, of course, carefully engineered. But I think the openness of a living system could, in fact, be maintained, at least for our purposes here, um, so that we can still observe quantum mechanical effects. Now, the really interesting questions, which I have no idea how to even begin to uh, to target, but I think they are, they are mind-blowing, they, they, are, they are amazing, they are very fundamental, um, are the questions like, if there are quantum effects, and if we establish this beyond reasonable doubt, could they be deliberate? Have they evolved even 
through uh, means uh, like any other evolutionary uh, processes through basically um, random mutations and natural selection. Could it be that some of these quantum mechanical uh, things experience an evolutionary pressure of the same kind that led to any other invention uh, in evolution? And then, of course, the ultimate question, the big question that Schrodinger kept asking is, do living systems require other laws of physics? Could it be that actually quantum mechanics somehow is insufficient, that we need to update it, generalize it, um, augment it, whatever is the word, with certain other things in order to understand that. I thought a nice, a nice statement to conclude with would be this witticism from uh, von uh, Forster, whom I cited uh, earlier as well, where he said, the laws of nature are written by man, but the laws of biology must write themselves which sounds like a very clever, I have no idea what this really means. I think I, 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 roughly, uh, I roughly understand what he wants to say. But that's the question that ultimately is the big question here. Uh, I'm going to stop here and thank you for your attention. <laughs>entangle entire macroscopic objects. Is there any actual evidence that this is true? I mean, I mean evidence as the, in the sense of the experiment you showed at the very end where you would observe interference or something. I mean, this is what people consider evidence of coherence. Yes, you're right. Uh, you're right. It, it, it's a good question. I want to make, um, um, because, because of course I, I gave a very brief talk and I didn't go into details. Um, the important thing to realize is that you are really only entangling uh, a very small part of the living entity. You are really only entangling the relevant degrees of freedom in this case. So it's certainly not as, uh, as glamorous uh, or as amazing as entangling the whole system, you know, like superposing a huge system in two different spatial locations. This, I think, uh, you can probably even calculate you will never be able to do it with, even with a cell, even with a smaller entity than that. So we're not talking about, about that kind of superposition of entanglements. We're talking about entanglements that may um, exist between very um, specific degrees of freedom, in this case certain energy levels within transitions that are well understood of one system then entangled to another system. That seems to me to be uh, very uh, plausible to, to achieve. Uh, the second part of your question is we have absolutely no evidence for this so far. Uh, that's, that's an experiment we would like to do at the end of the five years. I think it's extremely challenging. Um, and, um, and so far, I think uh, there isn't any evidence. In fact, there isn't any evidence even within a, a system itself. There is no conclusive evidence the different bits are really entangled. So even that's an open, uh, open question. And, and I think uh, there are many technological issues here. There are many experimental uh, difficulties that stand in our way. And I think that's the question. Can we overcome that uh, and, and, and do this? But I think because we are only aiming uh, at very specific transitions, we are effectively treating each of these systems as a qubit, if you like. So it's worth two qubits of entanglement but we are trying to get this between two living systems. That, that's the idea. That's the starting point. And then the question is, can we make it more and more complicated, of course. I have a follow-up question to that, if I may, which of is, course. of course, it's really interesting if you can put a living system in an entangled state. But what's much more interesting is if you can show that that entangled state changed the function of the system some way. Yes. Do you have ideas yes. how to take that step? Uh, that, that would go, 
absolutely what you're saying. Again, I'm driven uh, by by the questions of physics. I appreciate, I think you're completely right, that as a biologist, you would probably say, that's all nice, and uh, it's even nice if you discover a complement in a living system, but does it matter? Is it there, really? Has it evolved to affect some functionality, as you put it? I think that's the key question um, in, in biology. Uh, we have no evidence for this uh, whatsoever, which is why I would like to go. Uh, I think the nice games to play are in the direction where you genetically modify these systems, uh, simply to change, for instance, even to change the structure uh, of these molecules that you are, uh, the arrangements, let's say the spatial arrangements of them, in order to change different couplings between them, which would then presumably affect uh, the quantum mechanical properties. So I think this can be done in principle again, uh, but I don't think we have any evidence in that direction at all. But I think that, that, that is a fascinating question. So genetically modify them, make them better, or make them worse at what it is that you are studying, let's say like photosynthesis, and then see whether physically that's coupled to reduction or increase in a I, I think that would be amazing. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. So, um, any system that has a certain transition can be coupled into a um, micro cavity, and then you can observe this strong coupling. Is there any particular interesting or any particular characteristics of these living systems that make them? Uh, special because if you have this collection of dipoles and uh, you find a resonance that is close or that can couple into the microcavity, then you can observe this uh, strong coupling as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you're, uh, that's an excellent point as well. Uh, uh, you're right. Uh, it's because we can, uh, we can somehow identify a handle. It's very important that that whatever the technique uh, is in, uh, that you're using, in this case, of course, you're using spectroscopy and you have specific frequencies of light that you can uh, use to, to couple to the system. It's very important, of course, to know that your system is optically active uh, in that range of frequencies that you're using. If you don't, if you don't have that evidence, uh, then, of course, the system could be quantum mechanical, but it's just not appropriate to, uh, to probe it in this way. So other than having the right frequencies, the right transitions in the domain that you study, um, I don't think this needs to have any other, um, any other specific. So certainly, uh, as the previous question indicated, the property of being alive is not crucial, really. I mean, you know, a non-living object uh, with these frequencies, yeah. with the same frequencies, would pretty much respond the same exactly. way. Exactly, yeah. Um, you're right. So, so the question is really, that's why also this genetic engineering could be interesting, because you could have a system that's maybe not optically active, like the E. coli, some uh, bandwidth. However, if you genetically modify them, you may change the energy level structure to make them optically active. So there are all sorts of interesting games one could play. All right. Thank you. Maybe one last question, if someone has one. It looks like uh, that's it. So will you please join me to thank the speaker and both speakers for the session. <laughs>